Hi everyone, I'm Jilly Richards. I'm the director of the short documentary called Shiny Objects, The Conductor with ADHD. And this panel is to talk about ADHD, how it shows up as a superpower for creative professionals, especially filmmakers like us. And we're gonna talk all about um, not only some of the challenges that we face, but how to really work with it and embrace your gifts. So I'm gonna start out today by introducing the star of the documentary, uh, Rosemary Thompson, who is a conductor of the Okanagan Symphony Orchestra, artistic director of Opera Kelowna, and there's many other titles and wonder wonderful things to her name, but I'm going to let her introduce herself and talk a little bit about her journey and the story that we cover in the film. Rosemary? Thanks, Jillian. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to be part of this process. I've never really been involved with film before. It's certainly never been the subject of a film before. And as I've been saying to many people, I've been in the spotlight a lot because I'm on stage a lot, but it's never been about me before. So I was uh, there, I just said, so that's what we're not supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> I was diagnosed with ADHD in my mid 50s um, after struggling probably my whole life, but not really, really realizing why. Um, and then a lot of sequence of events. My job got particularly stressful. I hit menopause and things that I had put in place to manage just weren't working anymore. And um, my son was diagnosed with ADHD a few years before that. And so as I dove into learning about it and doing some reading, like everybody else, I, I'm sure I thought ADHD was just that six-year-old boy that couldn't sit still on his desk, but of course that's just scratching the surface. And um, so as I did some more reading and research on behalf of my son, so many things started to just ring bells and, and uh, twig that maybe there was something more here. So finally, I saw my family doctor, things that just were falling off my plate, my health had gotten really, really bad, um, and I just wasn't coping. And I, she said, so how's everything going? And I burst into tears and said, I think I have ADHD. Um, she was great. She put me through this um, set of tests right away and I started medication almost immediately. And um, that made a huge difference. But after a few months, it just wasn't, there were still so many things that I wasn't coping with. I thought it would fix everything, but of course medication is only one of the uh, multimodal fixes. And um, then I was introduced to Dan Duncan who has been my ADHD coach ever since. Um, I call him Coach Dan, because my husband is also Dan. So I've got Coach Dan and my dad. And uh, so happy that Coach Dan is here with us today. Uh, he's really taught me so much more than I ever thought I needed to learn about ADHD. And it's just made such a huge change in my life to, to know, first of all, and then to be able to learn how to work with it. And it's it's been amazing knowing you, Rosemary, and, and learning so much through this whole process about journey which inspired my own journey as well while we were making the film I was researching about ADHD I uh, I was also diagnosed so it really came full circle here I am diving into something about this amazing person and how she gets by in life and through that process I realizing that I actually had a very similar brain type and was able to then also get coaching with coach Dan who you're about to meet in a second um, so that I could really learn how to well I was learning how to make a film which is a lot of work and high pressure, which turns out actually works really well, well for somebody with ADHD. Uh, but what it did was allow me to really see the areas where I can get caught up and also focus on my strengths, which I, I didn't even see as strengths at that point. Uh, but before we get into that, I'm gonna introduce you to Dan Duncan because he's gonna sort of lay the field about what ADHD is all about in the creative professional mind and, and in life in general. But uh, I'm gonna throw it over to you, Dan. Please give us an intro uh, to talk a little bit about what you do. And uh, you can even mention your own discovery of, of your ADHD as well. All right, thanks, Jill. Um, and thanks, Rose, the star of the show, the real star. Um, so I'll talk about my own journey first and then ADHD in general. I'll reverse those if that's all right. <laughs> so I was diagnosed when I was 38, actually. I was taking my son in, he was 12. Uh, and there was a um, kind of a medication trial study for kids who were suspected of having ADHD. So I took him into his appointments and about the fifth appointment, the, the nurse and the psychiatrist who were working with my son looked at me and said, there's an adult version of this study happening in the fall, if you're interested, Dan. And I said, oh, I always wondered if I had ADHD. And they looked at each other and said, we're pretty sure you have ADHD. Um, so that began my journey. I was 38. But uh, you know, I had a lot of looking over my shoulder, like everyone does when they're adults diagnosed. 
Uh, for one thing, my report cards made a lot more sense knowing that I had ADHD. Um, and even episodes in school, especially, uh, ADHD is one of those things that it creates a zero or 10 in, in just about every situation. You're either top of your game or floundering severely. And um, I remember in grade 10, one of my, my teachers walking down the hallway asked me for a fight. <laughs> and I thought, okay, we never did have the fight, but I realized in school, I was that kid. And I didn't even know I was that kid. Uh, found out later from one of my buddies in band class that uh, we had a rookie band teacher. So we thought, you know, we would, we would see if we could initiate him and bring him into the fold. <laughs> so we made his life miserable. And apparently, you know, later on, my friend became a band teacher and talked to our former band, our former band teacher. And apparently he almost quit that year because of how bad we were. So I didn't think I was being that bad. So that's one of the things with ADHD, our symptoms and the severity of our impact it doesn't often dawn on us. It's often other people uh, that notice and, and um, you know, we kind of cope, we kind of adjust. I was a straight C plus student. <laughs> um, every report card said you could be getting A's if you would just try harder, pay attention, stop telling jokes, hand in your work. Uh, so yeah, looking back, it's like I had ADHD, but it wasn't really a thing in the 70s so much and um so now i coach i've been doing that for a little over a decade work with people who have adhd uh, i get to talk to a lot of amazing people i get to talk to a lot of struggling people i get to talk to a lot of amazing people who are struggling that's adhd right zero or ten it uh, uh the statistics for adhd among those who are at top of their game, at top of any kind of game, a lot of them have ADHD, they excel. But they're also, we're also overly represented on people who are struggling, um, people who are addicts, who are living on the street, who have amazing abilities and skills and talents, but never found a way for those to be uh, put to work, or implemented in their lives. So ADHD creates a barrier as well. And that's why ADHD is a superpower and it's kryptonite. <laughs> and uh, we have to purposefully take care of those areas that get in our way so that the advantages of ADHD uh, have a chance to help us thrive. Uh, and that's what I get to do as a coach is help people kind of find some momentum, find some traction. And every, as you can imagine, every client is completely different and every appointment with every client is completely different because we have ADHD. <laughs> Variety is, is one of the hallmarks, obviously. So uh, that's, yeah, that's a little bit of what, what I do. And I guess I train other coaches now to use the same framework that I've developed. And, and uh, uh, so I get to leverage a bit, influence even more people that way, I suppose. So Dan, let's talk, uh, let's, let's get into that a little bit more about um, if you can expand on, let's first look at where you see the most common areas that people get caught up, especially in relationship to their career, whether it's beginning or they're at the height of it. And then let's talk about uh, the the superpower, the the 10, the, the upside to it all after that, but let's, let's start with the struggles. Okay, so, so yeah, the struggles... ADHD looks like something it isn't. And at the beginning, it looks like executive function difficulties. And that's what the symptoms describe. So at first, it looks like forgetfulness, impulsivity, emotional react reactivity, um, poor planning, poor scheduling, bad sense of time, <laughs> and even space awareness, physical space awareness. Uh, so all of those symptoms are what ADHD looks like. So people respond to ADHD based on that. And usually that's a compassionate response. It's like, oh, well, you forgot. Let's, let's find a way that you won't forget to do it next time. Uh, or you can't focus. So let's, you know, let's find a way that it's easier for you to focus. But over time, people realize, hold it here. You can focus on video games for eight hours without blinking. 
but you're not focusing on your math homework. So now it starts to look like a choice because it's like, I've seen those executive functions working, so you have them. Why don't you just choose to implement those in these areas that you're that we want you to do, right? It's like math and homework and chores and paying the bills and filing income tax and all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> um, so, so people move from, hold it, this isn't an executive function problem. This is just your choices. So now ADHD goes deeper and people no longer respond out of compassion and collaboration trying to help us overcome our problems. They start to deal with our character and dealing with a person's character creates shame. And they deal with our choices. You're choosing not to focus on your math. And that, those are always covered with blame. You're like, you're, you're to blame for making those choices. So, so that's the impact, that's the negative impact of ADHD is where we're having, having trouble, not causing trouble, but it looks like bad character and poor choices. So people, tend to respond that way. And that's the impact of ADHD. It, as far as a person with ADHD, my symptoms don't bother me. They seem to bother other people. And so their responses are what ends up impacting me. My symptoms are bothering them. They think it's character and choice. So they respond to me based on that. And now I'm dealing with escalating negativity about shame and blame. And so that's the impact of ADHD. That's the deepest impact is the effect it has on the person, their identity, who they believe themselves to be. And there's all sorts of coping responses we develop um, trying to reduce that negativity that we're experiencing. So that's, that's the kryptonite is that those symptoms are the bait that cause this uh, escalating negativity in our lives. So the superpower is that the exact same executive functions that are failing us when, we, when our executive functions don't have the energy to operate, uh, they're full on when they do have the energy. So most people's executive functions like focus, it's, take focus for a good example. Um, <clears throat> when, we, when, our, when our brain is not giving us the energy to focus, we can't focus, not even a little. When our brain finally finds something that captures us and gives us the energy, we lock on. So now that's our superpower. At that moment, in that situation, our attention, can, our, our focus is giving us an advantage over other people who rarely get to attend. So our executive functions are on switches. It's like totally off, totally on. That's how they tend to operate. Kryptonite, superpower. <laughs> so we are at the mercy of what situations tend to energize our executive functions. And that becomes the areas where our superpowers lie. And that's what we should be playing to. Most therapeutic models, like counseling models and such, are often, most often designed to help you shore up your weaknesses. That can't have that can't work with ADHD because it's an executive function issue. It's not, you know, a skill set issue or anything else. So with ADHD, I mean, coaching from my framework perspective is you create external mechanisms to take care of those situations that don't turn that switch on. Find other ways to get those done, you know, externally. So you're kind of almost externalizing your executive functions. Uh, and you're mostly, though, trying to play to your strengths. You're trying to find scenarios that do give you that energy to turn those executive functions on. And now that is the ADHD superpower. Rose, when she's conducting, every switch is on, right? That's, that's the magic moment. Her brain gives her enough, more than enough energy for her to execute that function. That's literally executive functions, right? So superpower, but as, as I'm sure she'll acknowledge, all the supporting stuff to get up to that moment, returning emails, planning, keeping details straight, interacting with people over a period of time, kryptonite. 
So you, we got to find ways. That's what we do as coaches. We find ways to externalize these situations that don't give us energy, externalize them so that they, they still happen, but they don't happen by you trying to rely on your ADHD brain. <laughs> and then play to their strengths, play to the moments that, that the switch goes on. Right? That makes sense? So I learn more and I mean, I've listened to you talk so many times and I still learn more every time <laughs> we're talking. And I think we should, we can, let's circle back to that after we talk to Rosemary and with maybe a couple examples of what you're talking about too, because I think people would be really interested to, to see how that plays out in life. But first, Rosemary, maybe you can share a little bit, uh, reflect on what Dan was saying there and talk for a minute about some of the areas in which you really struggled at first before you knew about the diagnosis and, and worked with Dan, and then uh, really display or um, describe for us where you have now noticed and, and leaned into when your superpowers and when they're turned on, how that shows up for you now in life so other people can, can look for that in their own lives as well. Dogs. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. And I agree. Every time I'm on an, any occasion to hear Dan speak, I learn more. You know, we've been coaching for quite a long time together now. I remember, Dan, you told me that switch example, and you said ADHD brain's on a switch, neurotypical brain is on a dial. And that uh, really what impacted me. So I think, I think before I knew I had ADHD and started to dive into this, I didn't even really understand what executive functioning was. And as I understand it now with all the coaching and reading that, that, that is where the symptoms lie, right? So um, for me, I've since done some real breakdown of, of different parts of executive functioning and where I struggle and where I actually have some strengths of an executive function. But my biggest struggle is in keep, keeping my dogs quiet. Hi, get over here. Can you just grab him? Thanks, God. So sorry. They were so quiet when Dan was talking. <laughs> um, the time blindness is the biggest one. And I've always struggled with it. Everybody knows that I'm always going to be late for everything. And uh, it's, you know, sometimes it's just I'm the butt of jokes with friends and they'll tell me to arrive somewhere half an hour later than they're actually going or earlier than they're actually going to get there. And, um, and it's fine, but there's some very real implications for all kinds of things. I've never actually missed a flight, but I've come seconds close. You know, I'm always running to get there. And, and in a work situation, it's just not acceptable. Um, it's just, you just not good practice to be late. So when I started to conduct, now I'm actually the one that's leading the rehearsal. I can't be late. And not knowing I had ADHD, this is like 30 years ago or 25 years ago, um, it really worried me because I thought, I know I'm always late. I don't know why I'm always late, but I know I'm always late and anything I'd seem to try never worked. So I, um, I made a pact with myself that I would always arrive at the theater for either a rehearsal or a show half an hour before. And now every single time when I'm 10 minutes late, I'm 20 minutes early. <laughs> so that's worked for rehearsals and concerts still haven't made it work for meetings or for picking up my kids somehow, but that's sort of one of the things that I, uh, I guess I, I, now that I know what it is, that's sort of externalizing um, a symptom. So some of the other places that I've struggled is um, definitely in the communications piece. I think that so much is bouncing around in my head. I think about things so much creatively, creatively, both in the short-term projects that I'm doing, but also thinking long-term planning, that I never remember what I've shared with people and what I haven't. And so I always assume people know things when they don't. So it makes them a little bit, well, a lot <laughs> frustrated um, if they can't get information out of me. And it's not because I'm deliberately withholding it. I just, so I'm so surprised when someone will ask me something and I'll say, how do you not know that already? So I'm, I've been working with Dan on, on how to do clear communications um, all the various bits of administration that that come with being an artistic leader in an organization and now two organizations. So I've hired a personal assistant uh, that's been really, really helpful. And I've just asked everyone that's dealing with me to CC her on all correspondence. 
Um, she also checks my voicemail every day <laughs> because I go weeks without checking my voicemail. Um, and she just really helps to keep me on task with the deadlines and with priorities of things that I really need to get done. And that's made a big difference. Um, it also allows my brain then to be a little bit less cluttered so that when I am trying to lock onto things, I have the ability to actually sort of lock on. And then did you want me to talk about strengths too? I can't remember the other part of the question. No, that was that was great. And yeah, let's talk about now uh, the, the strength side and, and maybe even a little bit of your that that journey with uh, being and doing that we've talked about before too, sort of that right. switch and how you see yourself. Okay. So uh, some of the strengths I think that the ADHD brings me um, and has always brought me again with hindsight looking back is the ability to think outside the box. Uh, one of my first coachings with Dan, um, I was talking about one of my staff members that I was, we're very, very different people, very, you know, she's very skilled and I really want to interface with her better. So that was one of the things I wanted to work on. And Dan gave me this example of, you know, there's people that, that think best when they've got really clear boundaries, very linear, thinking about all the things that they need to do in a very linear fashion. And every organization needs those people. And I totally respect that. And then he said, and then there's people that are more comfortable to go in and out of the boundaries. And I said, oh yeah, that's me. And he said, no, that's not you. Do you remember this, Dad? <laughs> he said, you have ADHD, you have no box. <laughs> and that made so much sense to me. And literally, I think there's like, there's no blinders come on into your brain. So anytime I'm thinking about something, I'm thinking about everything. And what that allows is for lots of non sequitur creative thinking and has allow me to put together some programs that I've been really proud of, that people have found very novel and very exciting. And I think that that's been a real strength for me. Um, I've also learned that I'm a verbal processor. So I love being in teams. I love bouncing ideas off of people because that helps me to, to take those things that are all over and actually put them into something that we can um, put on stage. Um, I think, I know for some people, uh, ADHD, creates a lot of struggle with relationships. I definitely have some of those, but I think I've also got, um, I have a lot of empathy. And so I, I work very well in collaborations. And to me, that also brings some of the most creative um, quality of art making that I've been involved, in, involved with. So I think that that's partly amplified because of the ADHD. I'm really interested in working with other people and seeing how can we do spoken word with orchestra, you know, putting some combinations together that might not have existed before. And the result is usually pretty magical. I'm really glad you brought that up, actually, because, you know, uh, this panel is for everyone, but we're talking to a lot of filmmakers right now. And uh, as a filmmaker, uh, empathy is an incredible quality to have to be able to not only connect with well if you're doing a documentary who you're speaking to but also in a narrative film with the actors and, and most importantly the audience and and being able to really share a story takes it takes a deep degree of empathy in life to know how to relate and convey you know what is our humanity and Dan can you speak more to that empathy factor with ADHD so um empathy <sighs> I think is more of a, a core value. It's how we how we connect with life. Is uh, some people are more internalists, and maybe empathy is not maybe one of their highest core values. It's you know they they may do it, <laughs> they may engage through the lens of other people, and because ADHD amplifies everything about an individual, ADHD does not make you an introvert or an extrovert. It just amplifies which one you are. ADHD doesn't make you artistic or analytical. It just amplifies whichever one you already are. So ADHD takes everything about who you already are, zero or 10, right? Amplifies everything you are and everything you're not. So it creates this great dichotomy. And when people have empathy, when that is a natural core value for whatever reason, where they engage life uh, through the lens of otherness right it's not just i'm an island unto myself they feel more alive by uh they feel more alive by doing that and they are become better at it so i think rose's talent um i even hesitate to call it a talent it's it's intrinsic it's it's the being of rose <laughs> is that she easily connects and she's easily connected 
to by others. So there's this gravitation that that accommodates um, the flow between her and the world. And again, remember, every superpower can also be kryptonite. And so the intensity of that interaction, if the interaction goes sideways, that's amplified as well. The repercussions of that disappointment is amplified, just, just like the repercussions of that satisfaction that the good connection was amplified so so the impact that your natural abilities your natural um connections with people whatever that means to you the the impact of it becomes amplified by adhd so even the results of who you are are zero or ten because the energy flows at zero or ten and so that's why I say, you know, you don't have to guess who, you don't usually have to guess the personality and characters and skill sets of an ADHD person. They'll be self-evident if you're around them long enough. Um, so the empathy part for Rose, is, I think, is that natural gravitation that just exists and the implications of it, positive or negative, are amplified. And, and when she's in concert, um you know the, the, she's connected to the music the crowd the, the orchestra it's all one one being to her if i can put it that way uh because of that gravitation that's how i would put it i don't know if that's too s too hippie like for you rose but no that um, actually works pretty well <laughs> i agree i think it i think it's really great so it's it's I'm just thinking of people listening to this who are wondering now about like, you know, what are, what are my gifts? I have ADHD. How can I really amplify that? Here's my career. And, and it sounds like, you know, we're, we're saying the focus then is to, or what are you saying the focus? How do you, how do you narrow in on that and then really bring it out in what you do? People generally, nobody comes to a coach saying i'm awesome at this i'd like to be even better <laughs> right it's like here's all the potholes that keep getting in my way please help me fill them in um and so you know that's that's a journey but but throughout the journey i'm looking for i'm looking for their values really um if people live in their values the things that actually matter to them that give them meaning ADHD brain or no, your brain will give you the energy to fulfill that. And so um, our superpower, the, the sweet spot for ADHD people, I think more so even than other people, is, is where our values, our skills, and our interests converge. Because now we have meaning, ability, and fulfillment. And so um it's more important when you have adhd to, to to find on purpose what your sweet spots are and here's where we waste <laughs> here's where we waste those kryptonite moments when things are going sideways and there's strong emotions we're feeling adhd people tend to get into a a style of life where we start to try to avoid those strong emotions so shame obviously is a big one i've mentioned it already so a situation happens causes us shame another situation happens causes us shame another situation happens causes us shame and the, the mindset is i've got to stop i got to start avoiding those situations and so we get into a mindset that's trying to avoid problems avoid failures rather than pursuing success and so what I'm always trying to do, you know, directly or indirectly, is I try to tell people, don't waste your shame. Because your shame, uh, your shame, your frustration, your anxiety, whatever strong emotion you're having is telling you something matters to you here. Right? Your values are being threatened. If you just stop at trying to avoid the shame and by you'll never get to see to know yourself what are my values what moves me nobody has strong emotions in situations that don't matter to them 
So when you have a strong emotion, don't waste it. Don't just try to avoid that happening again. Dig beneath that and find out why it mattered. Because when you can start to identify the things that always move you, even if it's negatively, now you have identified something to pursue. Because if you pursue that value, if you try to find situations that will fulfill that value, now you're living. You're not just trying to avoid failure, you're trying to pursue success. And the ADHD brain often gets into a dichotomy. I'm either trying to avoid failures or pursue success. We rarely do a balanced approach. <laughs> so I'm always trying to move people over. What's the positive version of that failure? And let's pursue that. Because if you get locked onto pursuing what deeply matters to you, the shame will dissipate by itself. The anxiety will dissipate by itself. The depression will dissipate by itself because now you're fulfilling what matters. You're not just trying to protect yourself from the threat of losing what matters. And so, I mean, the coaching process is not complicated, <laughs> um, but that's, to me as a coach, that's, that's the root of all my coaching is I wanna get people pursuing success, not just avoiding failures. Unfortunately, because ADHD looks like something it isn't, and people respond to ADHD based on what it looks like, not what it actually is, that traps us into it, trying to avoid those negative responses people keep giving us. And it's just, it's just a, it's a smoke screen. It's not real. It doesn't exist. Just because we're living it doesn't mean it's hard to get out of. But we have to be invited to get out of it because we often get trapped in that avoidance, right, mindset. Have you noticed that for yourself, Rose, in the, in the coaching all the time you spent um, with your own ADHD, some of where you've seen that shift? And can you can you tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. Um, it was one of the early coaching I had, I think, that I said, oh, I should do something. And, and Dan stopped me and said, do you want to do it? And I was really surprised. I thought, well, what does that matter? <laughs> and now I catch myself. I almost never say I should. Um, because behind that, um, you know, and I was in the, when I was in this sort of rat race running on the hamster wheel, just I, I owe something to so many different people and I, I'm behind in my administration and I, I should do this, I should do this, I should do this. And, and it, it becomes so overwhelming that you can't get started. And so when I can actually change, if I'm writing grants or if I'm, if I'm, you know, anything that I'm doing, if I've come at it from a place of, oh, I have to do this now, I should do this now, it's so much harder to get started than if I um, build in the positive reason for doing it. So I should write this grant because the deadline is next week is very different from saying, and Dan, Dan gave me this as a cheer once, very different from saying, I can't wait to do this program where we're gonna bring music to the sidewalks around all the long-term care facilities so that seniors who are struggling in isolation get to have music in their life in this time of, of a pandemic. Start with that. And then I'm like, how can I make that happen? This is a great idea. This is gonna be a fantastic thing to do. This is gonna be a gift to our community. I wanna be part of this, your energy shifts. And so I am not 100% successful with it all the time. I, I do have wildly strong emotions about all kinds of things, but I am learning to sort of coach myself in situations um, to see where I'm kind of heading into that pothole again and to, and to think about how I can turn it so that, so that I can find a way to pursue it. And it, I think when Dan first talked to me about that, I thought of it as sort of these big, huge, um, things that had to happen but but it's really in everyday little decisions as well it's all kinds of ways you can apply that idea of of finding a positive energy to pursue something I mean when I first started coaching with Dan I just thought he was going to teach me how to be on time and not lose things <laughs> and pretty quickly I went uh I don't know what my values are and do I have any strengths because he continually referred to these ideas of pursuing your core values and leading with your strengths and and so I had to really dig into those and it's funny you mentioned the empathy piece Jillian because one thing that I did was I wrote to a bunch of people in my life from various walks of life and I asked them to tell me what they thought my biggest strength and my biggest challenges were that was a hard email to hit send on 
Um, and what came back overwhelmingly from people was that I had this really high degree of empathy, which surprised me because as Dan said, you don't always know how you are being perceived. You know, you only have your own perception. Um, but that was a really cool thing to discover. And since then I've relied on others to just to help reflect to me what they see my strengths as. It's hard for people sometimes, especially if you're struggling, to see that you have any strengths. Um, and that's really made a difference. I think that's made a difference in my energy every day to just keep thinking about what my strengths are and forgiving myself for what I've, I think my weaknesses are. And in one coaching, we, we talked about this and um, you know, I gave my whole list of weaknesses that I thought I had. And, and Dan said to me, you think these are your weaknesses, but I'm telling you these are your symptoms. And that was huge too. And then I just wanted to say as, a, as an artistic leader, and, and um, I'll just put this back to you, Jillian. Uh, there's, uh, you know, people say, so, you know, were you really excited about being the subject of a documentary about your ADHD? <laughs> I would say, no, at first. And um, I think the only reason that I was able to do this and and to allow myself to kind of put it out there and be vulnerable was because of the degree of empathy that I got from you. And so like you mentioned that as a director and I feel the same as a conductor, I'm trying to draw out the best in the musicians that I'm working with. Nobody is ever gonna give their best artistically from a place of fear. They have to come from a place of trust and a place of, of being supported. And so that they feel like they can let you push them to something that where you see that vision. Um, so I think that there's not, I think there's quite a lot of similarities between what I do in terms of trying to bring out music from an orchestra or an opera, a, a group of opera singers, as a director would be doing in a film situation where you're trying to get the best out of um, the people that are actually gonna be on screen. And I think empathy is a really important part of that. Oh my gosh, I love that so much. I love how you think. And um, yeah, that's, it's really true. And actually I wonder, Dan, if I'm even explaining it right or I'm understanding it correctly, but I know personally that one of the one of the biggest thrills I've I have in life on a regular basis is when I get to ask people questions and and hear their stories and it's it's not uh, I've never felt like I had to sit there and really try hard to pay attention because for me it it, it was a thing that would lock me in and and you know we'd be I'd meet someone at a, a gathering and we'd be off in the corner for half an hour and I'm hearing you know their entire life tale and it's just the most thrilling thing ever and so. I'm wondering from that ADHD perspective, if, if my value is connection is what's happening in my brain during those conversations, is it just sort of turning on the executive functioning or, or the, the neurotransmitter side? I'm sure you can explain this better, but is that what's happening? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I don't like the scientific explanation, but what I, but what I will tell you is you can't avoid it, <laughs> right? So it's, it's it, it, back circling back that's the being person right and too many times um we've been socialized into thinking we, ha we have to find something valuable to do okay <laughs> you, you can do something valuable but if if it doesn't fit the the who you are um adhd will amplify that disconnect your failure will be massive <laughs> because ADHD then won't allow you to not be who you are. So, so finding, finding things to do, finding activities or finding careers, um, et cetera, um, it, it's, we're better off letting them find us and just being ourselves. And that sometimes takes patience, and it certainly isn't socially acceptable uh, when we live in a world that wants a five-year plan and steps on how you're going to get there. You know, we can drum one up. It's not likely ever going to turn out the way we planned because um, our being will take over. And so it's, it's a little bit, it's a, I think for you, Jilly, we, we were at a, a gathering after the premiere of the, the documentary last on Saturday and Jilly's walking around she knows everyone in our city 
And I said to her, I, was I the last person in Kelowna you'd ever met? Because you know everyone else. So, so you could say, oh, you know what? I have to, I have to do that more often. Now, if you, if you play to the natural things that um, actually fuel your fire, the doing will take care of itself. So uh, that's the being and the doing thing. Um, yeah, we can make plans. We can choose careers. We can chart a path. Uh, don't get too attached to it because because you, your your being may find a better path. And if we're in the socially disciplined mode where I have to, if I start something, I have to finish it. That's more often than not a, a landmine than an opportunity. Um, ADHD people, we, we stray our, our way into success. We don't, we don't plan our way into success. We wander our way there because uh, the events, the variables find us and we respond. So we have to be very responsive, very in instinctive. Um, in fact, we handle crisis better when we are instinctive than when we have gotten into that avoid failure. I was just talking to a guy today and, and him and his wife are, you know, at, at odds more, more often, frequently, lately. <laughs> so, so what I said, what, what would you have done before when there was a little spat? And he said, you know, I would have walked up to her and held her and said, let's figure this out. Well, now he clams up and feels like walking away. <laughs> And if he can't walk away because that's disrespectful, he'll just be the deer in the headlights and say nothing. But when that's unacceptable because it's not causing resolution, he explodes, right? So it's, it's literally flight, uh, freeze, or fight. He was forced into the fight because the other two were socially unacceptable. But it's because he's in a mindset already, I need to avoid this conflict instead of literally diving into it with his being. This is conflict, this is uncomfortable. Let's get past this and find really the core value that's at stake here, if I can refer back to it. So, so with ADHD, we, we pursue crises naturally. And if we do it, with our being instead of the procedure of the doing, the socialization we've fallen into, uh, we're 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 problem solvers. We're we're crisis resolution experts just by how we're wired, because our radar picks up so much more than is just the obvious communication. And so um, I even forgot your question, but what I'm saying is important. Anyways, I'll, I'll go with that thought. So, so that's why I'm saying if, if we, if we get past the artificial, I have to adapt to become the people, the person people expect me to be, we're going to go into that doing phase and we're going to check all the boxes and never be fulfilled and really probably never actually succeed. But if we are the being person, if you stay true to who you are and constantly dive into the values rather than avoiding uh, problems, dive into who you are and keep going. Um, ADHD finds a place to land and gives you an advantage. It just, it just does. You don't even have to plan your way into it. It just, it just happens. <laughs> but. I love that stray into success. That's, so do I actually, especially uh, because after doing a, a, a project like this, after making a film, um, and it was, it was, you know, so profound and so uh, enriching, and I, I love the experience so much. And now, you know, we're 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 on the other side, or we're promoting it. But my brain is going, well, what should I do next? And I need to plan, and I need to, you know, have a proposal ready, and I need to go into the next film. And here's all the steps that would make sense. And, and lots of people are telling me different ideas, and there's this incredible feeling of pressure that I need to you know, roll from one into the other. And there's lots of ways to technically do that. And I've learned some skills, but there's also a piece of my heart that's just like, well, I don't know yet, but I can't wait. I need to, you know, I need, I need to do it now. And it's that division of the functioning of, of, of what I've learned and, and what the path is, you know, for 
other filmmakers or or people who are pursuing the next goal and the piece of me that's like well this you know I strayed into this but how do I how do I trust to be able to stray into it again that's actually a good point because when, when we get stuck when we have ADHD and we get stuck remember zero and ten we feel like we're totally stuck forever it's always going to be stuck and so sometimes we actually need artificially to do something to have some path to walk along right and that's often when the linear thinkers in our life can go well you should do this first and that first and that first so so it's it's not a bad idea to follow something that seems to be the most obvious path until an opportunity to wander off it presents itself right and that's when you need your adhd to take over this is the point i exit the plan and that's that natural instinct is probably uh, a better option than no i made the plan i better stick to it and usually it's no they made the plan i better stick to it or they'll be disappointed um so we have to be very good at you know wandering when we need to and, and well, being, being okay with that jillian that isn't that kind of how you wandered into this project in a way because we were just having coffee one day and uh out of the end of that conversation you said, I want to tell this story. I think, I feel like that's exactly what Dan's describing. Like we just created this opportunity and you jumped on it. That's such good advice, Dan. I, that's actually the perfect, the perfect answer really, because there are some steps I can take and uh, yeah, I'm ready to wander. So <laughs> maintain and keep that. Um, I just wanted to, I, earlier I said we would circle back to a couple of the external mechanisms and I just thought, can you, can you talk about a couple of them so that people can leave this with some ideas of what it looks like to, to do that, to help to set them up more towards what they want to pursue for success? Can you, um, can you round that out? Give me an example in your life where you uh, would need something like that. <laughs> well, when I when I think about a new project, and you know, I did the co-producing on this one as well. The the very idea of when I start to think about all the paperwork and you know things to set up and we do on time, it instantly all the excitement of what the story is about starts to starts to go and, and contract, and then it feels a little overwhelming, and and then my drive for it starts to go down, and I'm putting things off and procrastinating. I see, I see what you, so when we have to fit in, uh, I always, it, it feels to me like 95% of the world doesn't have ADHD and they built the world wrong. So we have to make adaptations to fit into the systems that already exist. So schedules, deadlines, budgets, expectations, <laughs> meetings, those don't always fit ADHD people. Now I'm not saying they don't because some people with ADHD are extremely good administrators because they have that natural gift and ADHD amplifies that natural gift. But in this field, often creative professionals are, are not wired that way generally. But so when we have to satisfy other pre-existing social constructs, if I can put it that way, they need to be externalized. So if there's a schedule, everything needs to be parked in time i don't care if it's a five minute task or an all-day task park it in time not so that you can constantly remember what's coming but so that you can forget what's coming because adhd brains we want to lock on to what's right in front of us our hyper focus is designed for the immediate the urgent the right here so if we're not energized by something that we have to do like i always use the example i have to phone revenue canada which i guess that's the irs in the, in the states the equivalent so okay i have to figure out my my the tax forms that they actually want me to present because the ones i sent in were apparently wrong so so it's an annoying thing i don't want to keep mulling it over in my head so i take that problem and I park it in time. 10 o'clock Friday, I'm going to phone Revenue Canada. That's not enough. That's organization. ADHD brains aren't 
disorganized schedule wise, we're unmotivated <laughs> to do things that don't turn the switch on. Trust me, phoning Revenue Canada does not flick my switch on. So, but I have to do it. So, okay. So that's the organization, Phone Revenue Canada. The files are on top of the filing cabinet. Here's the topics you're going to talk them about them or to them about, right? So I take all of the information, all of the data, and I put it in that reminder so that I can forget I even have to phone them. Now it's not taking up space in my head and energy and anxiety. Um, but when the time comes, organization is not motivation. Just because a reminder pops up, I have to do a couple of other ADHD things. I have to create the trigger and the switch. The trigger is that the alarm will remind me. I don't want to keep searching my schedule. When am I phoning Revenue Canada again? When am I phoning Revenue? I don't want to do, I don't want to think about anything that's not in my time circle right now. So I set alarms. When it's time, it comes to me. The information's there. That's the clarity. But the real success is what I call the switch, which means something very brief that starts the whole thing in process. So phone Revenue Canada, here's the information. At the end, my reminder would say, dial the phone, it takes five seconds. So now I actually have a five second annoying task to do. Because if I dial the phone, I'm likely just to wait till the answer and carry through with the task. But if I think of the whole task, I'll just go, yeah, I'll do that next Friday. I'll do that next Friday. Because it's insurmountable and annoying. But the switch <laughs> creates the momentum. Starting something is usually 80% of the energy it takes for an ADHD person to do a task that they don't, that doesn't appeal to them. So those are kind of the little externalizations that you're, it's not working in here, park it in time, let it come to you, create a switch, just do the switch. Just do the switch, it takes 10 seconds. Did that help? Oh, that was so fantastic. That's that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> it's like if I get going. So I like the idea of actually writing down some steps to just get over that first hump of um, initiating what, what's happening. Thank you. This is great. I'm going to go back and watch this video and keep playing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've done really well. I mean, we're close to an hour. Rosemary, is there anything I haven't asked yet that we should talk about? I think uh, that being and doing thing is was really revelatory for me. And um, the other piece that I think is really important for people that have ADHD, especially if they don't know they have ADHD and they're they're getting a diagnosis, um, is the the shame will also dissipate when you start to have some self-compassion and get help. <laughs> uh, it was so revelatory for me to get help in my life in my 50s. And I think as a conductor, that piece, because it was so interest-based for me, like I remember the moment I was assisting friends with their choir. I was a pianist and and that was the pursuit I was I was going after. And and I stood in front of these beautiful youth singers and and I can still remember the piece and I remember the feeling of their sound coming back to me and being connected to that and it just woke up this passion for me so conducting for me is easy because it's so full of interest but all the other things that have that I've struggled with um as Dan said I just kept trying to shore them up myself and shore them up myself and so learning about the condition understanding how it's impacted me um and then more importantly, allowing myself to ask people to help me to learn more has just made me a better conductor. Because now when I when I dive into the conducting, I'm really diving in. Like I just feel like so many other things um, have helped me to feed that. So that positive pursuing success, I think as a creative filmmaker, any, any role you might play in, in a creative world, um, we we creative types always love that kind of diversity in people anyway <laughs> neurodiversity gender diversity sexual diversity and so i think that that if you can embrace the strength of of your of what makes you diverse and what makes you unique that's going to give you the success as opposed to avoiding those um unique things about yourself and i you know i'm in my 50s and i feel like i've just 
had this rebirth. I feel like I've just sort of finally started to look at life as something to lead with joy and with passion, all parts of my life, not just the ones that I, that came to me easily. So I'm really, really grateful. And I'm really grateful that you uh, asked me to make this film with you because that journey has been amazing. <laughs> now I want to learn how to make films. <laughs> oh my gosh, you'd be amazing. <laughs> I don't know if I could conduct, but you know what? I'll try anything. <laughs> um, Dan, anything else you want to end off saying or any other bits of advice you'd like to give before we close it out? Uh, I just think in general, um, I mean, I know a mission in all three of us share is to try and demystify ADHD. Um, you do have to take it seriously. It has some horrible life outcomes when all you're planning to is the kryptonite, <laughs> just trying to fill in potholes. Uh, but there's a massive potential beyond that that ADHD actually also amplifies. And so take both seriously, pursue success. If potholes show up, find ways to fill them in, you know, whether it's just medication to help you, you know, neurobio uh, biologically and or uh, coaching, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy works for a lot of people as well. Um, but I guess my advice on that psychosocial end would be try to stay away from anything that smells of, we have to make you better at what you're no good at. <laughs> no, find artificial ways to fill in the potholes and play to your, play to your strengths and your life will find you. It's just that simple. Uh, thank you too so much, not just for today, but for this this last six months, I guess, since we've known each other and well, Rosemary, I've known you for a while, but the last six months we've really worked intensively together and uh, for all these different panel discussions and events we're doing now, it's it's so great to, to speak with you guys and I highly recommend all of you out there who are watching this to surround yourselves with people who have ADHD because they're a pretty great group of people to get to work and and live and create with. Uh, if you want to check out the film again, the name is Shiny Objects, The Conductor with ADHD. It's in the festival circuit this year in, in 2021. It will be released uh, wildly or wildly, wildly successfully, <laughs> widely on uh, YouTube, I believe next uh, summer of the of 2022 through a program or a group called TELUS, which is in Canada, uh, Story Hive, which is what funded the film in the first place. They've been great, great support this whole way. And right now, if you'd like to watch it in October of 2021 in November, uh, you can go to portlandfilm.org and be part of that amazing festival that's happening right now. Check it out along with a lot of it, other great films from all around the world. So thanks so much for enjoying the discussion. And if you want to talk more or learn more about what we were talking about today or connect with us, you can do that uh, on Facebook at Shiny Objects, the Conductor with ADHD Facebook page, or just Google the title and you'll see all the different websites and places that we're located. And, and uh, there's a trail on YouTube as well. There's some, some discussion going on below that. So we're pretty easy to find because of the title, but I hope to hear back from you, hear your comments, and uh, you can comment here on this video as well. And uh, we'll be following it and, and getting back to you as well where we can. So thank you all, love you all. And thank you Portland Film Festival for having us be part of this fantastic uh, experience.